Hey there, welcome to another episode of All About Your Benjamins with focus on the book, More Than Money. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to my friend, Michael Baker. And rather than try to memorize all of the great things that he is doing, I'm going to read you his bio from his chapter that begins on page 63 called Finding a New Life Plan. So Michael is a manager and founding member at Vertex Capital Advisors, a financial services firm that specializes in financial planning and retirement income strategies. Michael's passionate about showing clients that have no reason to fear money, finances, and the financial guys or gals. He knows many people view financial planning as a tedious process, something that they simply must endure, and his goal is to change that, along with ours as the community and this book. Michael is a member of the Financial Planning Association, aka the FPA, the Investment Management Consultants Association, the Advisors Growing as a Community, the AGC, and Kingdom Advisors. So that is a quick introduction to Michael. Introduction to Michael. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all in the next one. So I'll just kick everybody, kick this off with just the uh, comment that I texted you. So everybody, Michael is a good friend of mine, and I texted him this morning, and I said, you know, this text is more for me than it is for you, but. I'm recording these episodes in batch, and we, we've got to be short and sweet on today because we could both con- continue this conversation for probably an hour at a time going off of this story, going, going, going. So um, I thought it was a good way for me to start, to my, start my day knowing I was going to hop on the mic with you. But Mike, um, we'll just get right to the, to the book. So I've got your chapter opened up. For those of you reading at home, hopefully you already have the book. Page 63, Finding a New Life Plan um, is Michael's chapter. And how long have you been a financial advisor? So I've been working in financial services since 2009. Okay. So I'm good with numbers. That's 13 years. So over 13 years working with people, helping them with their money, countless stories you could have chosen um, to illustrate what financial planning can really be like and have a strong message behind it. What was it about this particular story that... Oh, oh I did record. Damn it. I'll edit that out. What was it about this particular story that... Um, made you choose this over the others? This story just, it was one of those pivotal moments just as an advisor. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, when when you grow up in, in the business, you're taught about the importance of our work and, and the impact that we can have. And I think a lot of us internalize that and we kind of get it. But there are certain moments where it just hits you that this is really game day. Like it's, it's game on all the stuff that we've been taught, all the things that we know, all of our experience and expertise is now needed more than ever. And this was one of those stories for me where I knew that this was going to be game changing for this entire family, for this lady in particular. And she also, um, interestingly enough, my story is about a lady who, who loses her husband and she called me right after she found out. Like mm-hmm. I arrived at her, I, I live a few minutes away from her at the time and I didn't know what else to do. I was putting my son to sleep when she called and I thought it was odd that a, a client would be calling me that late. So I, I thought maybe something was wrong, just kind of intuitively. And of course she's standing there with uh, the sheriff's uh, deputies and, the, and someone from the coroner's office she had just been notified that her husband had passed away and she thought to call me. So I thought that was just such a powerful moment um, because it, it kind of spoke to the relationship that we had, but also just that's where her mind was going, right? Who, who can I call? And um, so that's why I picked this story. Yeah. It's you know, our profession. Those of us that are doing it and creating strong relationships with our clients, our profession is a pretty cool profession. We get to experience a lot of great life milestones, but also we are there in these moments like you just described. I had a similar one two summers ago, and I think I was the third person um, that was called when one of my clients unexpectedly passed away. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about you. Actually, I do know. Like, I think that when we received that call as a financial advisor – it's just like we received that call about one of our family members. Like I remember being like bre- uh, my breath being taken away and my eyes watering it up and just not, not being able to believe it. And mm-hmm. when you are able to step back and process a moment like that with a client, like in the moment, like it sucks and then we got to get to work. Right. But then when you reflect back and to realize that we hold that special relationship, like 
that they would call us at that moment at that time like speaks volumes to what it is that we really do. That's why the book More Than Money is such a perfect title um, to explain what these stories are trying to illustrate. Um, what's what's the main message from from the chapter that you hope readers or listeners, if they listen to it, take away from it? Well, my chapter specifically is about you know losing a spouse and essentially finding a new path, like you know having to go through the stages of the shock of a loss and the financial stress, the emotional stress, all of that. But hopefully, you know, the message is that with, with planning, with, with guidance, like you can, you can rewrite your life story. Um, Does it replace who we may lose? Doesn't, doesn't, you know, fill a void that will be with us. But at the same time, it, it does show that, you know, Hey, life, life can go on. You still can, um, have a beautiful next chapter in your life. And, and that's what I hope a lot of people get out of the chapter that I wrote. So I don't think this goes too deep into kind of like the nuts and bolts of the chapter, but mm-hmm. like just for people listening and watching, like how do you even begin to help a client, whether they've lost a loved one or maybe they just realize like, this is what I'm big about. I'm not on the right path for me. Your chapter is called a new life plan. I need a new mm-hmm. life plan. Like how do you help somebody figure those things out? Like it's, I, what I've learned, what I think is that a lot of people don't really know what they want. So whether we have this great reset of the loss of a loved one or there's something that's happened to make us realize we want something greater, like how do you help somebody figure out what they really want to create that new life plan? A lot of conversation. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, you know, because, you know, specifically in, in my story, the, or the the story that I wrote in this book, I guess you could say, I, I have now, this is becoming more and more a part of my practice. Um, you know, our industry, we talk about niche marketing all the time, and I've kind of like stiff armed that away from me. But I, I'm here I am on your show, like stepping into like fully embracing it. I, I do believe um, helping widows is going to become a niche focus of of my practice moving forward, just because every year, I have a handful of, of ladies, um, that are referred to me who, who lose their husband, lose a spouse. And I've walked through this journey many times now, and it's different for everybody because we all grieve in different ways. So I think part of it is, you know, being understanding of that and, you know, helping them understand like, yes, there are going to be some, some things that we have to deal with administratively with an estate or with the finances that, that can't really wait. But some of the big decisions can wait. And what, that's what I encourage is let's talk about whatever it is you feel like you want to talk about. And let's work through this together, you know, because if we can eliminate financial stress, if they know someone's there to help them with the administration and with the paperwork and, and getting things from A to B, that is a huge relief from a stress standpoint. And I just say, let, let's be open. Let's be open to what the future holds, because what you may think you want today, you may not want those same things 12 months from today, mm-hmm. you know, or 18 months from today. And so that's part of, part of that journey. And that's what I just stress to everyone is like, you know, first of all, let's, let's handle what we need to blocking and tackling. Let's get the fundamentals, but at the same time, let's be open to what may come up for you over the next year to two years, because it, it may change. Well, and I think that that just shows like the book outlines this in all the chapters and hopefully, you know, that's what people take away from it, but that mm-hmm. there are a, there's a different mindset for a certain type of financial advisor. There's a mindset of more of less about the, the, the spreadsheets, less about investments, less about sales and more about life. And to your point, listening and figuring out what they really want. And how Mm -hmm. could you realistically expect somebody who's gone through this trauma of losing a loved one, a spouse, if you're focusing on widows, to start making decisions with money? And, you know, got to be careful painting, uh, painting with a broad brush. But historically, our profession has not been very human centric. It's Mm -hmm. been very sales, numbers, investing. We got to move these things around. No time to, you know, just got to keep moving because, you know, the way the business has been lined up, the way we've been compensated over time, it lends towards needing to create action where you're talking about inaction. Like Mm -hmm. hit hit the main things we have to do and then let's just pause and breathe. And the reality of it is the majority of the decisions you think are super important to make today, 
most of them can wait. And you're better off waiting to your point because once you get past this part of grieving and kind of figuring out what this new life might look like, what you might want in that future version of yourself is different than the one who wants it today. So I think that that just highlights in, I find it encouraging. I've been in the business a little bit longer, um, 18 years, so not a whole lot longer, but Mm -hmm. um, to see that that's the direction the profession is going because I think that's more impactful. And I love the idea of you having a niche working with widows because if you're continuing to be introduced to women who have lost their spouse, there's something about you um, that is unique that is a skill set that most people don't have. And I love the idea of a financial services profession where we have, a, I'm not a beer drinker, but I loved the idea of a bunch of like microbrewery advisory firms, right. whether it's whether it's the firm itself or the advisors. Like I know your guys' firm is a little bit larger. I don't think we need to all have a bunch of small firms like mine, but if we have a bunch of microbrewery type advisors that you know exactly where you're going to go because of their expertise and their skill set lends it better, I think that's that's good for the profession. Um, so I kind of hit on one of the stereotypes of our profession with the opportunity to write a story like this and, you know, be on a podcast and you have your own podcast as well. What's one misconception about financial advisors or our profession in general that you would love to debunk? Man, there's, there's so many different directions I could, I could go with that one. I would say, you know, I think my, my opinion I think there are a lot of great people that work in financial services. What I think gets pushed around a lot is there's a a big misunderstanding about different business models and what some people can do and can't do. And a lot of times that gets put off as like a personal attack. Like, oh, these people, you know, people that do this, you know, they, they can't look out for their clients. And I think that, you know, having gone through this, with, um, you know, with widows or just in our general planning, there's so many different professionals that you need. You know, you need somebody that understands insurance. You need somebody that can do legal work. You need somebody that knows taxes. And, and if there's all of those, you know, specific skills can be found in one financial office, then fantastic. But that's rare. You know, usually you got to have, you know, a team that's put together for any one household. And I think that one of the things that, I would tell clients to be looking for find an advisor that's willing to collaborate with other professionals that because that only strengthens the plan that you're trying to put together for yourself. And so I think that there are a lot of advisors that are willing and open to be collaborative and want collaboration. And I think that's kind of a misconception that a lot of advisors aren't open to that. They want to kind of work in their own lane and are not willing to do that. And I I find that not to be true. Again, goes to a shift in the mindset of advisors in the profession that I think it's more moving towards an abundant mindset versus the scarcity mindset. You know, I can't, I can't refer you the old mindset. I can't refer you to the insurance guy because he might try to do your investments, and now I'm competing with somebody who's trying to help you. So I'll just either not address it and leave a hole in your plan, or do a really crummy job and just plug stuff. So I'm not doing the best for you. So yeah, I think I would agree with that. A collaborative mindset, an abundant mindset is something that would be a big plus for a financial advisor. So this is this is kind of a fun part of the show. I think this is where we as advisors get to be human even more um, beyond the chapters and beyond kind of sharing your expertise, but just kind of being transparent. So we'll start with the positive, and then we're going to get to the question you didn't know was there. So if you've okay. been listening to these episodes by now, you know that I sprung a, a surprise question on everybody. What is your best financial decision? My best financial decision, um, I would say, you know, probably, probably twofold. Um, mm-hmm. So number one, like, I think my best financial decision that I've made over the last five years is I've, I've made a very intentional effort to be investing in my own education. And I think that just with the rate of change that we've seen, just with technology, different types of stuff going on in the world, we as advisors, we're, we have to be on top of what's going on, the mm-hmm. things that are going to be driving conversations, questions for clients. We need to know that. But at the same time, I just feel like our learning never stops. Uh, you know, there's there's new techniques and tools that we can learn about, but there's now new science that's being you know, put out there in the universe about behavior and psychology and how humans behave with money and, and how we and we make decisions and that's just an entirely new universe. So I've really poured a lot of money into my own education in that field. And then the second thing I would say is my wife and I, we kind of made this decision this past year 
um, that, you know, kind of we're, we've never been huge, you know, we, we celebrate Christmas of course in our house, but we, we, we never gone overboard. Um, and for those of you who do don't feel judged, um, you know, mm-hmm. do what you feel is right for your family, but we've never gone overboard, but we've decided that from now on, we're really going to kind of tone down material things for our kids. Mm-hmm. And we're really going to be investing more in experiences. So we want them, you know, if they want to do sports, great. If they want to, you know, try something in the arts, fantastic. We want them to have experiences. We want to travel with them. We want to do life with them because, you know, we just feel like over time, the one things that will, the things that we will think back, look back and see are priceless are memories and experiences. So that's one thing that we've been doing with our money. We, we've done a similar thing. Um, I, I, I see more people talking about that, which is, I find exciting. I also think it's one of those things that like you have to learn on your own. You have to go Mm -hmm. through and buy the things to realize that the things don't really matter and that the experiences are what hold more weight. And since you're a basketball guy, um, I'm going to, I'll share my most recent one on, on your episode. We, um, we took the, I took Roman and Leo for Christmas. We got tickets to see the Grizzlies, Memphis Grizzlies play the Pacers. Okay. Because ja, Ja Morant is Roman's favorite player, and Ro, I will give Roman credit. He's been he's been rocking with Ja since uh, he was in college. So this is Back not fair weather. Okay. Fan. Yeah, and we saw the dunk of the year, hands down, one of the most impressive plays I've ever seen. But like that memory, like Roman is still talking about that game and that memory weeks later. And I know that that'll be something that he won't forget. And it makes up for the memory beforehand because we tried to see the Grizzlies play two seasons ago and it was end of the year and they sat jaw. Mm. So I had a, at the time, I think Roman was 11. I had an 11 year old sitting in the stands, bawling his eyes out because he was Christmas, playing. his Christmas present that he had waited until March to see and get to experience. Jaw wasn't playing. And the, the silver lining in the story is we got to see jaw warm up and like before game shoot around, which made us realize he really wasn't hurt. Um, but then this year's game more than made up for it. So I, I'm, That's awesome. I'm on the experience, um, ship with you. Okay. So yeah. this is the question you didn't know was coming. Okay. And I, I think it's good for us advisors to be transparent and talk about the bad things we've done. So what's your worst money decision? My worst money decision. Hmm. I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, in my younger, in my younger years, mm-hmm. I, um, I, you know, I had, I had credit card debt. And, um, that was, that was always kind of stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, when I finally started making good money, you know, as a financial professional, I've kind of bit the bullet and just said, you know what, I'm wiping out this credit card debt and I'm going to be done with it. And, you know, we haven't carried credit card, a credit card balance in probably 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't know, man, uh, as far as really terrible financial decisions, you know, I think from, probably from my former life, um, you know, I, I spent almost a decade as a broke model and actor. And so mm-hmm. I know what it's like to be broke. Mm-hmm. And and so I've been pretty conservative with my financial choices, mm-hmm. um, you know, since then. So I, I, I would say here, here's what I would say. And I don't, don't know if this qualifies as a worst or bad, but it's just something that I wish I would have done differently. Perfect. My, my wife and I, when we, when we bought our first house, we bought a, we, we used her income to qualify because, you know, I was just getting started in financial services and I was, I was making an income, but I was like, look, I'm building a business. Let's be conservative. Let's use your income. Let's, let's get a house. Um, that way we don't buy over buy. Mm-hmm. And we bought a rental. So we bought under market value. We fixed it up. Nice home. And, um, when we went, it, we went to move, I sold that house instead of keeping it. Mm-hmm. I could have kept it and possibly started, um, you know, use it as a rental and I sold it instead of and i wish i would have done that because just in this area of the country where i live that house has almost doubled in value Mm -hmm. and it would have been a great investment um but you know that's you know that probably doesn't qualify as like a horrible financial decision it's just something i wish you know i would have thought about uh, i thought about a little bit more Mm -hmm. carefully before i pulled the trigger on it but um i i wish i could give you something juice i can't think of anything off the top of my head that i'm just like oh man that was just awful no, that's okay. I mean, I, I think that your answers were good, and maybe I should yeah. re- reword it. Um, 
because maybe it shouldn't like worst means there's a negative side to it. I and mean, there is a lot of shaming that goes on mm-hmm. when it comes to finances, which I don't really like. Maybe it needs to be reframed to is what's a like what's a money lesson you learned from you know something you would do differently. So that yeah, way, that's good. That's it's good. better. It's better framing. I still want to get, but what, the takeaway of it is, I want people to see that even those of us that are supposed to be the professionals mm-hmm. don't do everything right with money. Okay, uh, I have one for you. I yep. have one if we've got time. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Um, and, and for the for the sake of uh, the compliance world. Uh, I'll try to be generic, but um, back in 2017, mm-hmm. when you know crypto was just going supernova, mm-hmm. I got involved. Uh, I started playing around with it mm-hmm. because I'm like, there's this new thing. Clients are starting to like ask about it. I want to have a working knowledge so that if someone comes to me, I can at least have a conversation. Had mm-hmm. no intention of trying to really advise people on what to do, what not to do. Um, just be careful, have a conversation, that type of thing. And anyway, I, I purchased, uh, so I put a marginal amount of money into mm-hmm. one of these, one of these assets and it went, it went up ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you the actual, I won't give you the actual number, but let's just put it like this. I had a conversation with my business partner. I said, you know, I, I should just sell all of this and buy myself like a Ford F-150. Mm-hmm. And I, I did not do that. Mm-hmm. Because of course, you know something that has quadrupled in two weeks is, of mm-hmm. course, it's going to quadruple over the next two weeks, and mm-hmm. you're just an idiot if you don't sell it. You know, take a win, and so of course I held on to it, thinking it was just going to continue this, you know, rocket to the moon, and it did not. Um, mm-hmm. So I wrote it all the way up and wrote it all the way back down. Ended up selling it and getting you know a, a little tiny profit, but mm-hmm. um, that that was a lesson learned for me. Um, obviously, those are highly speculative assets, um, but the lesson was, and we try to tell our clients this too, is we need to learn how to take wins, mm-hmm. you know, and, and not be greedy. Like if something you know if something has reached, you know, if it's allowed us to reach the goal we were out for it's okay to take the win and then Mm -hmm. recalibrate for the next thing, you know, instead Mm -hmm. of just saying, Oh, you know, more and more and more is going to be better because Mm -hmm. that may not happen. And so, um, we're, we're, we're people too. We, we make some of the same mistakes. And and sometimes I would tell you, it's like, you never know when the advisor you're talking to is not only giving you advice because it's something that they've seen. It may have been something that they've experienced personally that they know, Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm telling you, you know, this is the prescription for success. So there you go. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I did the same thing with the NFT. I didn't buy it with any expectations, but um, I will give you numbers. It got up to, I spent, let's just say $1,600, which mm-hmm. is the most I ever did, but I had a good reason to buy it. And it got up to $49,000. Okay. Yeah. Now, again, I bought this perfectly content for it to go to zero. It's, this is my fun money and my financial plan. I have no expectations. And I told my wife, if this gets above 50, I'm selling them out. <laughs> it never got above 50. And it I went know. right back down. I think I would still eke out a little bit of a gain today. Um, but the reason I was comfortable with that was I had no expectations of it. And right. I think the thing that is is kind of cool in some regards is I don't have any bad feelings about not selling it at 50. Like that would no, have okay. been cool. But and, and the silly thing is, part of the reason I didn't is I didn't want to take the short-term capital gain um, at that time. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing I would also add to this part of the conversation, this is why, at least for me, as a financial advisor, I stick to boring, diversified portfolios of ETFs and mutual funds right. tied to a financial plan and a goal because I don't want to have to make that type of decision. Um, I, I would much rather have a regular rebalancing and have a, you know, a game plan in for generating income and those types of things to where it's not like, Hey, we've had this thing go really good. The momentum behind it's good. Let's, let's hold on. I don't want to mess with that. And truthfully, we don't need to do that for clients to really help them reach their goals. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, I think for me, what only thing I would, would just add is I think the, the coaching element of that is, is is very real because, you know, like you said, this is my fun money. This is something that, hey, if, if I lost it, great, you know, fine. If it goes up, great. You know, and I think part of it is like, let, well, let, you know, it may happen. Mm-hmm. What happens if it does go up? Then, you know, what's our, what's our exit plan? And for me, you know, I mean, I was, like I said, I was up there. I mean, I could have just went and bought 
sticker price a ford f-150 truck Mm -hmm. i know because i looked Um, (laughs) and you know looking back i was like man what a dumb dumb thing to do but again it just shows hey these lessons that we talk about in finance and investing they are real the real life Mm -hmm. application and even even professionals can fall victim to our own human biases and 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 blind spots Mm -hmm. all right we'll we'll bring it back to the book so when you heard about the idea of the agc put together the book what was it that made you um want to participate in the project well, I have to say I'm I'm very very fortunate because when we first talked about writing the book, I did not think I was going to be able to participate because I just had so much going on and I originally said I'd love to do this but I'll pass. And then I don't know if it was just divine intervention or or circumstance, but it came back around and said, "Hey, if you want to be involved in the book, um, you know, let us know." And at the time, some of the stuff I'd been working on finished So I said, you know what, I do want to do this. And for me, it was really just about, I, I, I liked, I had been in part of the brainstorming sessions. I kind of knew the direction everyone wanted to go. And I said, you know what, I want to, I want to contribute. I want to be part of this. And for me, it was just a matter of the experience, you know, because I do believe in what we do. And I believe that this is a very much a relationship business and the day to day, decisions that advisors across the country are helping people make, uh, they have an impact. And, and I was really hoping that our book, and I feel very confident that this book does in fact, in fact, convey the impact that financial planning can have in people's lives. So I was very excited to just be part of it. Just be, just be part of the experience. Well, I'm, I'm glad you circled back, um, because the book wouldn't be complete if it wasn't. And I do think things work out for a reason. So, um, appreciate you coming in. So if you know, people are reading, um, not so much like to find you as a financial advisor, but they want to give you feedback, tell you how much they enjoy the chapter, uh, where can they find you out on social media? Well, my, uh, my Twitter is at Michael H. Baker. So, you know, a lot of people, uh, I know you're active on Twitter and have a, have a following. So I'm at Michael H. Baker on Twitter. But if people want to catch up with me, my latest project is actually my YouTube channel. Um, okay. So I would love to interact with people on there. Um, and I am at The Wealth Technique on YouTube. So those are my two primary platforms. Of course, I have a LinkedIn profile because who doesn't? Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm most active on those two platforms. So if anyone wants to reach out, would love to connect with you. And I'll, I'll have a show notes for everybody's episode. So we'll have those down below just to make it easier. But nice. Um, well, Michael, I want to thank you for a participating, writing a great chapter, um, joining us today on the podcast, but also just for being a tremendous financial advisor and doing good work, helping people see a different type of advisor and change the perception of our, our profession. I appreciate having advisors like you, not just in the AGC, but on the outside, but just want to thank you as well. Um, and everybody watching and listening, want to thank you for tuning in. People who have bought the book, thank you for supporting. If you have not bought the book, go buy it. It's everywhere now, uh, more than money. Uh, a lot of great stories in there. My, again, Michael's is on page 63, I yes, believe 63. so. Yes, right. 63. 63. Um, read it. Hit them up on YouTube. Let them know what you thought about it. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. So just don't forget everything about all of this. The whole point of it is to make you realize that financial planning is more than money. So that, we'll see you all in the next episode. Thank you. <laughs>